Hi everyone and welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed the previous episode on second wave feminism and early liberal feminism. Today I'm going to look at another facet of second wave feminism, perhaps one that's a bit more exciting and interesting, and that is radical feminism. Now, although liberal feminism and radical feminism share some common goals, such as the liberation of women from normative cultural representations of myths of femininity and men's dominion over women, like I explained in the previous episode, radical feminism strategies to achieve these goals are different and considerably more radical. Some of radical feminism's activism included picketing the Miss America pageant in 1968, abortion speakouts, making sexual passes at men in Wall Street, and a protest at the National Bridal Fair, amongst others. If you are familiar with some of these activisms, you will also know that radical feminists are often stereotyped as bra burners, even though a bra has never been burnt at any of these protests. Radical feminism is also quite famous for coining the term the personal is political, and this is a famous second wave phrase that has been cited and adopted in many different forms. So we see this in the critique of the institutions of marriage, child rearing and sexual practices. And while Simone de Beauvoir's writing began to touch on some of these issues, like I explained in the previous episode, it was Shulamith Firestone's The Dialectic of Sex, that is her book, and Kate Millett's Sexual Politics, that's her book, that grounded radical feminist theory in America. In the dialectic of sex, Firestone envisions a feminist utopia where women are freed from their historically determined biological function of bearing children, which reinforces sexual difference and which has oppressed women for centuries. For Firestone, through the use of modern reproductive technology, such as contraceptives and in vitro fertilization, the social and cultural structures that have created division between the sexes, and this is especially referring to the biological nuclear family and motherhood, and by implication, the unequal distribution of power between men and women will be abolished. Firestone explicitly states that there should be the full restoration to women of ownership of their own bodies, and also their temporary seizure of control of human fertility the new population biology, as well as all the social institutions of childbearing and child rearing. For Firestone, only when this is achieved will genital differences between human beings no longer matter culturally. Now to get back to the discussion of science fiction, for this episode too I will focus on Ellen Ripley, Sarah Connor and Catherine Janeway, perhaps more on Catherine Janeway and Ellen Ripley than on Sarah Connor. Some of Firestone's ideas, especially artificial reproduction, as you can see, unmistakably appeal to science fiction. It is no coincidence that sci-fi feminist literature in the 1970s explores the liberating potential of the hard sciences, in particular reproductive technologies, that promise elimination of traditional gender roles that link women to maternity. Some theorists have also argued that the fact that the alien films do not feature two actors, as there are in human patriarchal society, which are male and female, but rather three, which are men, women and xenomorphs, the aliens, the power structure of patriarchy is disrupted and it presents the possibility for this structure to be modified. The way in which xenomorphs reproduce by laying their eggs in male and female hosts indiscriminately also suggests that men are as receptive to all positive and negative associations with childbirth as women are. For radical feminists such as Firestone, the fundamental reorganization of the social structure that institutes patriarchy is perhaps the only means for women to be truly liberated. Although already somewhat implied in the alien films with having three actors and not just two, a new social structure is explored in detail in Alien Resurrection. Now, if you haven't watched Alien Resurrection, this has been described as uh, one of the worst alien films, but it has its charms and I highly recommend watching it. Alien Resurrection is the fourth film in the Alien franchise and it features a very different version of Ellen Ripley. 
So thanks to my friend Emma's recommendation. For your convenience, from now on I will mark the spoilers with a sound and I will also give the timestamps of the spoilers in the description of the podcast. So um, I hope this helps. So here comes the spoiler. In Alien Resurrection, Ripley is brought back to life through cloning technology two years after the events of Alien 3, where she jumps into the fire to destroy the alien queen growing inside of her, in order for scientists to acquire the xenomorph queen that she was carrying at the time of her death. However, when Ripley is resurrected, she receives some of the xenomorph's DNA, which turns her into a human-alien hybrid who exhibits superior strength and intuition and she also bleeds acid. <laughs> Big spoiler there. Similarly, the alien queen also receives some of Ripley's human DNA and she gains a womb rather than laying eggs, which is kind of gruesome when you see how um, she gives birth to this new alien species and how it kind of destroys her womb and rips her apart. Uh, this movie is kind of gross if you're not into uh, gross and horror movies. Um, anyway, the alien queen cons consequently gives birth to a new species called the newborn and it kills the queen right after its birth and then it recognizes Ripley, who is a human being, as its biological mother. Even though Ripley displays the term maternal attachment to the newborn, she recognizes its potential threat to humanity and then again she saves all of mankind by killing the alien. Just as a fun fact, in this movie there's a scene where Ellen Ripley throws a basketball over her head into the goal and um, it looks like, obviously it looks like it was done with special effects, but Sigourney Weaver actually made that throw. She turned around and she threw the ball over her head and it landed in the goal. So that's one of the like famous things about the movie is uh, Sigourney Weaver actually did that, which I thought was really cool. Anyway. For some theorists, Ripley's fundamental struggle throughout all four alien films is the fight for agency and the control over her own body. They trace various instances throughout the series where, alien, where Ripley experiences patriarchal attacks against her ability to control what happens to her own body, both in terms of sexual violence and attempts to control the means of her reproduction but also how she reclaims control and by extension overthrows the institution of patriarchy in each instance. So here are some examples. The first occurrence where Ripley's reproductive agency is challenged by patriarchy is in Aliens where this idiot Burke attempts to impregnate her with an alien larva by trapping her and Newt in a room with two face huggers for his own financial gain. In this way, Burke, who is the symbolic agent of the patriarchal company, attempts to control alien production by controlling the means of Ripley's reproduction. The second example occurs in Alien 3, where Ripley has been raped, I'm like in quotation marks, in her sleep by a stray face hugger on her ship and she subsequently becomes the vessel for the xenomorph queen against her will. More instances of Ripley's forced reproduction continue in Alien Resurrection. So here she's not only forced by the patriarchal company, which was represented by, was it Wutani Corp in Aliens, but now they're represented by a group of scientists. So she's forced by this patriarchal company to play host to the Xenomorph Queen once again, despite her efforts to kill the Queen by committing suicide in Alien 3. She's also, as famously stated by Ripley herself, the monster's mother, which refers both to the queen and to the new spe alien species called the newborn. In the case of the newborn, even though Ripley does not physically give birth to it, it acknowledges her as its mother, which again represents reproduction that was forced upon her despite her maternal attachment to it. So, by killing the newborn, Ripley ultimately kills the result of patriarchy's final attempt to use her reproductive capacity for its own gain. And through this reclamation of her reproduction, she gains her greatest victory over patriarchy. By the end of the Alien Quadrilogy, after achieving this final victory, 
it is clear that Ripley ultimately affects the full restoration to women of ownership of their own bodies, or at least of her own body, as Firestone hoped women would do. But Firestone does not only present theoretical arguments for the elimination of male privilege and sex distinction, she also gives practical solutions to the arguments put forward in the dialectic of sex. Some of her solutions are quite out there, uh, so if you want to go read them, you can, but for now, I only explain the ones that apply to Ellen Ripley. Ripley's reclamation of her body throughout the Alien Quadrilogy may seem like a theoretical victory only, only, perhaps because it bears no concrete solutions for women because it's set in a fictional future. But it does explore repro artificial reproduction's liberating and oppressive possibilities for women, even though it has to do so in the liminal realm of sci-fi. With that said, although some of Firestone's more practical suggestions that will aid in eliminating sex distinction, according to her, are nothing short of revolutionary, and for me, like I said earlier, actually it is too radical, some of them have manifested to some extent in representations of the second wave power woman. And one may even argue in retrospect that many have been partially implemented in 21st century society as well. So I highly recommend reading her book and then uh, you can decide whether Firestone's ideals have been realized or not. So the first one I'm going to talk about is single professions. So, single professions, according to Firestone, stipulates a single life organized around the demands of a chosen profession, satisfying the individual's social and emotional needs through its own particular occupational structure. So, similar to Betty Friedan, which I discussed in the previous episode, Firestone's definition of single professions suggests that women can gain social and emotional fulfillment through pursuing a career and not necessarily through marriage and raising children. So, like I have explained, Ripley and Janeway are also pretty good at that. They are career women. The second alternative for Firestone is living together, where two or more partners of whatever sex enter a non-legal sex or compa companionate arrangement, the duration of which varies with the internal dynamics of the relationship. She envisions that such a relationship will be more equal than the nuclear family structure since the dependencies of sexual reproduction on two individuals are not involved. A third alternative that Firestone considers is households, where a large grouping of people are living together for an unspecified time and with no specified set of interpersonal relations. A household, in contrast to a nuclear family, is not based on biological reproduction and therefore the division of power caused by the nuclear family can be renegotiated. So for Ellen Ripley, who seems to frequently find herself on a starship or even Captain Janeway, who is always in outer space with her crew, one or more of these alternatives often become the norm. In my opinion, Voyager is a prime example of Firestone's household. In the fifth episode of Voyager, called The Cloud, Janeway notes in her personal log that Voyager has become more than a crew and that she needs to become more than a captain to them because of their unique situation of being stranded in the Delta Quadrant on a starship. And this is really the moment that I kind of fell in love with Captain Janeway because I felt so sorry for her and I felt so moved that their situation is so dire and so particular, but that she still was willing to put herself and her crew in the situation in order to do the right thing. So um, this episode is actually one of my favorite Voyager episodes. And again, I highly recommend watching it. So this reflects Firestone's structure of a household. Voyager envisions a heterotopian space, or what some theorists call a feminist heterotopia, that conceives new ways of how community, family, gender, and race could function in a future world. The construction of Voyager as a heterotopia, or as a household, 
allows Janeway to become an autonomous hybrid as a character and it imbues her with both feminine and masculine traits without her becoming trapped in false gender binaries such as masculine or feminine, culture or nature, thought and emotions, intelligible or sensitive, or logos or pathos and so forth because she needs to do all of these things at once because now she is the captain but she is also someone that is kind of the head of a family of this household on Voyager. So I don't know if this was actually what Firestone hoped for in terms of households when she theorized it but nevertheless this is liberating for Captain Janeway and um, this is what allows Janeway to move beyond being either hyper-masculine or hyper-feminine. Like I explained in part one of this mini-series, is that what makes a heroine a truly a heroine and not just a replication of the male hero in a female body is their hybridity of masculinity and femininity, which makes them different from the male hero. So I haven't really explored everything about femininity for these uh, three characters yet because that will be part of the next episode which focuses on cultural feminism and motherhood. But let me quickly talk about Captain Janeway's femininity that is brought about by the starship household structure. So actually Voyager is a military vessel but because it becomes stranded in the Delta Quadrant it is forced to simultaneously become a domestic space where the crew live, which potentially destroys the patriarchal nuclear family that is structured by the dichotomy between public and private. So like I said, Janeway is not only the captain of her crew, who represents the classic Lacanian father that is the disciplinarian and topmost authority of the ship, the voice of reason in tight situations and the ethical and moral enforcer of society's laws, but she also becomes a mother figure who nurtures her crew, provides domestic and protective haven for them, and is also responsible for their well-being and garners their devotion. There are many touching scenes where some of the crew members go to Captain Janeway and they're all like, oh, Janeway, I have this problem, and then she kind of resolves it for them. She nurtures them and she hugs them and she takes care of them. So in this way the household in Voyager, which is the opposite of the nuclear family in terms of its fundamental structure, presents the possibility for Captain Janeway to transcend the essentialist notions of gender. In the second sex, Simone de Beauvoir, which I also discussed in the previous episode, she begins to touch on what she believes to be the complicated sexual relationship between men and women that is the consequence of women not being considered men's equals. According to de Beauvoir, the bed, okay, the bed, which is without saying related to sexuality, is the place where men assert their aggressive superiority the most. She describes the problematic and unequal sexual exchange between men and women as follows. Now I quote, He wants to take and not receive, not exchange but ravish. He seeks to possess the woman beyond that which she gives him. He demands that her consent be a defeat and that the words she murmurs be avowals that he extracts from her. If she admits her pleasure, she is acknowledging her submission. Okay, now that's a pretty scary description of sex. It makes me never want to do it. <laughs> but anyway, in her chapter on love, uh, Firestone, she sees the sexual situation between men and women as much more problematic than Beauvoir might have anticipated two decades earlier. For Firestone, and I quote, love perhaps even more than childbearing, is the pivot of women's oppression today and as an extension of de Beauvoir's conception of the subject and the other, love is the final opening up to or surrender to the dominion of the male other. So that's what Firestone said about sex. For second wave feminists, this unequal distribution of power in heterosexual relationships is fostered by the institution of the nuclear family. It is therefore no surprise that these heroines are largely presented as asexual 
and they function outside the structure of the nuclear family by often occupying households, as well as by not becoming involved in romantic relationships. And I find this very fascinating about these three characters is that they're all alone. So for Janeway, her status as captain of the ship, according to her, this is what she felt. And um, I also listened to an interview where Kate Mulgrew actually also said that she was not going to allow Captain Janeway to go into any re romantic relationships because she felt like that is just the luxury that a cup captain does not have. So I'm wondering actually how much um, how much of this part of Janeway was actually determined by Kate Mulgrew, the actress, and not by the writers themselves. So anyway, for Janeway, her status as captain of the ship immediately prevents her from engaging in romantic relationships with her crew. In the episode Elogium, I think it's in the first season, Chakotay asks Janeway, Chakotay is her first officer, and uh, he's quite handsome, apparently, um, if she would consider having a romantic relationship on Voyager, to which she replies, as a captain, that's a luxury I don't have. Now I'm saying that Chakotay is apparently handsome because uh, I had the privilege of talking to Kate Mulgrew on Zoom last year, and she, uh, her answer to one of my questions, which I will maybe explain later, was that, oh yeah, I would never let Janeway sleep with Chakotay, but he was really cute. So that was uh, Kate Mulgrew's words. Um, I thought that was quite uh, funny and quite sweet. Anyway, when Janeway does attempt to express her sexuality, she is also punished for it as her few sexual encounters throughout the series are always discredited to her either being under some alien influence um, that is especially seen in the episode Workforce from season 5 or 6 I think that causes her not to act as herself or her lover being non-human such as the hologram she falls in love with in the episode Fair Haven and that episode, um, I think it's also in season six, that is really funny. Uh, in that episode, there's Janeway's famous line. So to give some context, she, she finds out that this hologram that she's in love with has a wife. So she goes to the holodeck controls and she changes his parameters. And she says her famous line to the computer. She says, oh, computer, and one more thing delete the wife <laughs> and that is Janeway's famous line she has two it is there's coffee in that nebula and delete the wife so delete the wife is from that episode called fair haven so Janeway's ultimate deprival of the nuclear family is possibly represented by her fiance who eventually also gives her up for dead and as I mentioned in the previous episode this denies any future possibility for Janeway to have the nuclear family that is so oppressive in Firestone's opinion. Then Janeway, Janeway's relative asexuality caused by her remaining alone throughout Voyager's journey further points to the show's attempt, attempts to leave Janeway unfettered by masculine or feminine roles that could potentially be dictated through romantic relationships. If you would like to um, look at some of Janeway's other romantic ventures. There's only two others. Um, the famous episode, Counterpoint. She kind of falls in love with this alien called Kashyyyk, and um, there's a very interesting interchange that happens. So I recommend that episode, and also the episode, Resolutions, where she and her first officer, Chakotay, get stuck on uh, some alien planet, and they can't go back to Voyager because they have a virus. And if they go back to Voyager, the virus will kill them. But as long as they stay on the planet, they are not affected by the virus. So just her and Chakotay stay there and they um, kind of develop romantic feelings for each other. But then eventually Janeway is like, no, I can't do this. And then Chakotay is like, yeah, but I'll always protect you as my friend. And yeah, that whole thing happens. So that's also a really nice episode, and I also recommend that one. Okay, so enough of Captain Janeway's romantic or lack of romantic ventures. Ellen Ripley also does not conform to the structure of the nuclear family. Although Ripley remains alone in Alien, upon her return to the planet LV-426 in Aliens, 
she rescues a little girl named Newt, and she develops a really subtle love interest in one of the marines named Hicks. Now, actually, um, I didn't pick this up on the first viewing. Um, I only realized the second and third time I saw Aliens that she actually has a thing for Hicks and that he has a thing for her. So, this nuclear family unit that is formed by Ripley, Newt and Hicks uh, at the end of Aliens privileges Ripley's, law, Ripley's role as a mother against her heroism. And even more problematically, it offers Ripley redemption for being a bad mother that left her own daughter, Amanda, behind in order to work on the Nostromo. So this is temporarily the case, definitely, but uh, here's another spoiler alert. In the beginning of Alien 3, as soon as they crash land, crash land on Fiorina 161, Newt and Hicks die. <laughs> they do not survive the crash and Ripley is alone once again. So um, although that may temporarily be the case that she becomes part of a sort of a nuclear family, um, it's immediately dismantled at the beginning of Alien 3. And then in Alien Resurrection, this heterosexual nuclear family unit is further subverted because Ripley actually forms this uh, relationship with a female android, Annalie Cole, played by the awesome Winona Ryder, uh, which is kind of, uh, uh, has a lot of uh, homosexual undertones. So um, in that way, Ripley also disrupts this nuclear family unit. Now, um, this is the first time Sarah Connor is popping up, but this is the same for Sarah Connor from Terminator. The possibility for Sarah Connor to have a family is shattered when Kyle Reese, the father of John, dies in The Terminator. Then at the end of the film, Sarah Connor is seen pregnant and driving into the desert alone. In Terminator 2, John tells his friend that his mom always messes up relationships, yet it is ironically the machine, which is the Terminator sent back in time by John to protect himself, that acts as the father figure for John in Terminator 2. While watching John and the Machine, Connor says this in her post-apocalyptic voice, the Terminator would never stop, it would never leave him, and it would never hurt him, never shout at him or get drunk and hit him or say it was too busy to spend time with him. It would always be there and it would die to protect him. Of all the would-be fathers who came and went over those years, this thing, this machine, was the only one who measured up. In an insane world, it was the sanest choice. So that's Sarah Connor's little monologue. So even though Sarah Connor, the Terminator, and John seem to form a sort of a dysfunctional nuclear family toward the end of Terminator 2, Spoiler alert again, the Terminator has to be dismantled in order to prevent its technology from possibly initiating another apocalypse. And Sarah Connor is once again left to be a single mother. In the final scenes of the film, it is suggested that Sarah Connor managed to raise John well without a father figure. As we see the old Sarah Connor sitting on a bench alone and watching John play with his children. So for these three heroines, they function outside of the nuclear family construct because perhaps it is considered to be a prime oppressive force for second wave feminists such as Firestone and the Beauvoir. Now we are getting to the really cool part. <laughs> this is uh, one of my favorite aspects of these heroines because I just find it so fascinating and um, interesting how all of this developed. So, in the next uh, part that I'm just going to discuss, um, these things are not really, uh, it's not canon. Uh, so none of this is actually what happens in the movies or the series. But this is a specific reading that some theorists have uh, adopted when uh, analyzing these characters. So the next thing about radical feminism, another radical feminist solution for subverting the structure of the nuclear family is do 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 lesbianism <laughs> okay so some theorists um explicitly position lesbianism or 
queer or um, but especially lesbianism within radical feminism and some groups such as the radical lesbians that was a group in the 1970s they wrote a 10 paragraph manifesto and they even go as far as to suggest that feminism is the theory and then lesbianism is the practice of feminism so of course this isn't true for all radical feminists and definitely not for all feminists and um, because of this stereotype that all radical feminists are lesbians um, many people also stereotype the second waivers as anti-men or as lesbians so that is uh, one of the, the problems that existed from this, but definitely there is a lot of radical feminist theory that focuses on lesbianism. So the interesting thing is that although it's not canon, in interpretations of these characters, especially Ellen Ripley in Alien Resurrection and Catherine Janeway, um, lesbianism or queer readings is quite commonplace. Now, I'm not sure if you're uh, familiar with fan fiction, but I'll get to that later. But there is a lot of fan fiction about Captain Janeway as a queer character, and also uh, not as much, but also some of it uh, as Ellen Ripley, especially in Alien Resurrection, as a queer character. So let me just explain what fan fiction is and what shipping is <laughs> so i'm not sure if you're familiar with this term but within the star trek fandom especially fans would often reimagine two characters that are not romantically involved on the show in romantic relationships with each other and this is called shipping uh, i think it's because it puts characters into relationships <laughs> so they call it shipping and um, then these interpretations would typically be posted on the internet in the form of blogs or um, image edits or online literature called fan fiction or slash fiction. Uh, we see it manifest in all these forms, uh, especially on the internet. Now, um, there is a very infamous uh, Star Trek ship. It is called the Kirk Spock slash fiction. Um, that's quite interesting because it imagines these two, especially the really masculine Captain Kirk and then the really rational Vulcan Spock, uh, as they are as if they are in a relationship, romantic relationship with each other. So um, this has been quite subversive because it provides a more fluid masculine identity for the very masculine Captain Kirk to imagine him being in a romantic relationship with Spock. Now some theorists have said that the central point the central premise of slash fiction or fan fiction is i quote the troubling of the gender categories that are taken for granted in the television series it explores now in uh, star trek voyager which is where captain janeway appears one of the most popular ships is the Janeway 7 ship which imagines Captain Janeway and then the Borg that she rescued 7 of 9 in a romantic relationship. Now this is quite fascinating. Um, last year Star Trek released a list, I think it was around Valentine's Day as kind of some like Valentine's event, but uh, on the Star Trek website they released a an article maybe i will post it in the discuss in the description so that you can go read it if you like um the star trek web website posted an article of like all the star trek fan fictions that there are and then um the janeway 7 fan fiction actually it said in that article there's 704 on online fan fictions that pair captain janeway and seven of nine so that's quite significant. At least 704 people have written fan fictions that imagine these two characters together. So um, I think that is quite significant and that's why I'm discussing it. Although it's not canon and um, in my... Uh, it wasn't an interview with Kate Mulgrew, but when I got to meet her online uh, on Zoom for one hour, my question to Kate Mulgrew was, because I was so curious about this, I asked her, Kate Mulgrew, is Captain Janeway gay? And um, 
was she ever in love with seven of nine or you know did you ever think she was in love with seven of nine because the way Kate Mulgrew portrays uh, Captain Janeway, it comes across as if she's in love with Seven of Nine. Now, that's my opinion, and maybe that's my reading based on my bias. But um, especially like the second and third time I watched Voyager, I was like, oh my goodness, they're really gay. <laughs> or they're really like, there's a lot of like uh, romantic tension between the two characters. So Kate Mulgrew's answer was, no, they're not. Um, Captain Janeway, she never considered her to be a queer character, but uh, she said that Captain Janeway was definitely very competitive with Seven of Nine, and um, they were both really strong characters and strong women, so they would often disagree, and um, I think that came across as maybe some romantic tension on the screen. There's also this well-known thing that um, Kate Mulgrew didn't like Jerry Ryan, uh, who played Seven of Nine, uh, when she first came on set, because Kate Mulgrew really wanted to portray a female character that is strong without being sexualized, without being involved in romantic relationships, and all of those things. And then they brought Seven of Nine on, and um, she's very sexualized. And I'll discuss her in a later episode on cyber feminism. But Seven of Nine is very sexualized and um, she was just brought onto the show. Well, this is what the producer said. She was brought onto the show to appeal to the male audience because by season four, the Voyager viewership was dropping. So then they brought Seven of Nine in to kind of get the viewership back up again. So Kate Mulgrew didn't like that. <laughs> she hated that. And uh, so they said that she was quite difficult on set, especially towards Jerry Ryan who portrayed Seven of Nine. So a little bit of interesting background there for you. So obviously this thing goes quite a long way. But yeah, that was Kate Mulgrew's answer. Uh, Seven of Nine and Janeway are not in love with each other or anything like that. But um, there is definitely subtext that explores that. And interestingly, this is very interesting. By the end of Star Trek Voyager, they actually... Oh, this is another spoiler alert. Spoiler! <laughs> Uh, they actually paired Seven of Nine with Chakotay, which was Captain Janeway's first officer. And um, yeah, in the final episode of Voyager, it's kind of implied that she got married to Chakotay, Seven of Nine now, <laughs> uh, which was quite sudden. And a lot of fans disliked that because it didn't really make sense because this relationship, it, no one saw it coming. It was just kind of like they put it in the end there just for putting it there. I don't know why they did that. Um, so interesting was that when I watched Star Trek Picard, which came out last year, or was it the year before? Um, Seven of Nine is actually right at the end. Here's another spoiler. She is shown with another woman, uh, Rafi, which um, they are seen interlocking hands. So kind of implying that, oh, they kind of hooked up. So in Star Trek Picard, they actually made Seven of Nine queer, which I thought was very interesting. And um, that kind of just makes this case for Seven and Janeway as like queer characters even stronger. But um, anyway, that is uh, enough of that. Let me get back to the discussion on this. So the romantic subtext between Captain Janeway and Seven of Nine has been noted by many fans, as I pointed out, but also by many feminist theorists and especially uh, pop culture theorists that write about this. So there's this one um, theorist, her name is Bowring. She analyzed a very popular fan fiction. It's called the Just Between fan fiction series. And I will definitely uh, put a link to that in, in, the in the description too, if you want to check it out. It is written by Gina Dart. And um, this theorist has argued in her paper that the way Janeway is portrayed in the Just Between fan fiction series shows the potential for Janeway to move beyond falling into these false masculine and feminism, uh, feminine dualisms which are imposed on her as a leader. So, like I said, the other theorists saw Janeway's embodiment of masculinity and femininity as a positive sort of hybridity, 
uh, this other theorist that writes about just between says that in the Star Trek TV series, Janeway moves between being hyper feminine in some episodes. So the example she gives is resolutions and counterpoint. And I think I've mentioned these two episodes earlier in the in the today's episode in today's podcast too. Uh, so let me quickly explain why they say that uh, in these two episodes Janeway is hyper feminine so in resolutions like I said Janeway and Chakotay Chakotay get stuck on this planet together and then they briefly start to feel kind of romantic feelings for each other and then many fans have accused Janeway of actually acting as a damsel in distress in this episode because Janeway kind of protects her from the storm and then he builds a bath for her and he makes like a bedboard for her because she likes to read before she sleeps and then um yeah he it kind of seems like she falls into this weak feminine stereotype and then in counterpoint Janeway is also accused of being hyper feminine because of her makeup (laughs) the theorist noted that her hair is a bit more auburn like reddish her lips are dark red and her cheeks are full of rouge like she has blush on her cheeks and then she kind of acts as a seductress who pretends to be attracted to this alien Kashyyyk in order to save a group of refugees now again I don't completely agree with that reading because I think she actually liked Kashyyyk it it wasn't like pretending or she didn't want to seduce him actually he tried to seduce her in my reading of the episode but you can watch the episode and decide for yourself so I don't really agree with this, but anyway, that's what the theorist said. Then um, the episodes about hyper-masculinity, where we see Janeway act like hyper-masculine, the theorist lists the episode Equinox, which is a two-part episode. It's a very good Voyager episode, and I will list all of these episodes in the description as well, so that you can watch them if you want to see. So then the theorist says that in Equinox especially, she rockets from one end of the masculine-feminine dualism to the other. Now in Equinox, Voyager stumbles upon another ship that got stranded in the Delta Quadrant. It is called the USS Equinox. Um, So the Equinox is much smaller. It's a Nova-class ship, I think. And uh, we constantly see this competition between her and Captain Ransom about who has the biggest ship. And then she goes to really violent extremes after finding out that the captain of the Equinox has betrayed the ethics that Janeway regards as so important. And he also broke the Prime Directive. Uh, Not that Janeway doesn't break the Prime Directive. I think she also broke it a lot, in my opinion. Uh, She says she never broke the Prime Directive. But then she gets really upset because this captain broke the Prime Directive. So then this theorist suggests that queering Janeway has the potential to allow her to move beyond these um, two dichotomies of either being hyper-feminine or hyper-masculine. So the author especially lists several examples of how Janeway's romantic relationship with Seven in the Just Between fan fiction allows her to move more freely between the public and private domains and also between masculinity and femininity, which apparently makes her a more, I quote, complete person. So um, I'm just reading some examples that this theorist argues. She says that the public-private debate is disrupted and resolved within the first chapter of Just Between, where it becomes evident that the crew's knowledge of Janeway's relationship with Seven does not compromise her command as she thought it would. Now, this um, harks back to that idea that Janeway thought that if she was ever in a romantic relationship, it would compromise her command. Then um, she said, uh, as I mentioned earlier, she doesn't want to be in a relationship because she's the captain. So it's a luxury she can't afford. For this theorist, what's even more liberating of a relationship between Janeway and Seven is that it apparently forces Captain Janeway to perform a new gender. Now, gender and sexuality I'll cover in another episode, but to just elaborate a little bit, The series says that in the Voyager television series, Janeway is coded as female, feminine, and heterosexual, especially in the first four seasons of the series where she has long hair and she's still engaged with her fiancé, Mark. 
but uh, even though that engagement is really, you know, she's like 75 years at light speed travel from him. But anyway, we consider her heterosexual because she's technically engaged to Mark. However, her relationship with another woman, especially with Seven of Nine, allows her to renegotiate at least two aspects of this gender identity. So in the Just Between series, in the fan fiction, Janeway is not only homosexual, but the woman she loves also has a complicated gender identity, as Seven is both human and machine, with a feminine outwards appearance, but also with a lot of physical strength and a more masculine and rational character. So Seven's fluid gender identity makes it even more difficult to fix Janeway's gender through her desire and through their sexual interactions in the just between fan fiction and then the theorist says that this confirms a willingness on Janeway's part to embrace fluid gender identities. Finally this theorist also claims that it is because of Janeway's romantic relationship with Seven in the fan fiction that she does not jump between the two sides of the dualism such as masculine feminine weak and strong controlled emotional intuitive, logical, and so forth, but rather now she is able to easily be any one of these as the situation requires. Now this is an interesting analysis and this theorist definitely uh, shows quite convincingly that que queering Janeway has its potentials, but as I have also argued and shown in the previous two episodes uh, of this podcast, actually Janeway already embodies both masculine and feminine traits and queering her might not be necessary in order to liberate her from masculine feminine dichotomies because she manifests these both of them even without being paired up with seven. So, like I explained earlier, a heterosexual relationship with another crew member could also dissolve the boundaries between public and private for Janeway, just as much as a homosexual relationship could. And, um, you know, whether Janeway decides to not go into a homosexual or a heterosexual relationship, um, still, she considers it a luxury she cannot afford. So... Imagining Janeway as a lesbian does not necessarily release her from the masculine feminine binary, but actually it might do the opposite and inscribe her even more tightly within that dualism. Like some people say, oh, Janeway is a butch character. She's just like a man in a woman's body. So we can fall into that kind of trap again, too. Anyway, what inscribing Janeway with this queer subtext does, and whether the writers intended it or not, I don't think they did, uh, what it does achieve is that it removes Janeway from the possibility of the patriarchal heterosexual nuclear family according to radical feminist reasoning. Although Janeway's asexuality, or the fact that she decides to remain alone throughout the Voyager series, also sets her apart from the nuclear family, and in my opinion, this is maybe a bit of a more successful approach. For many radical feminism, feminists, it would be lesbianism that provides the possibility of the disruption of the nuclear family. And it is fair to assume that radical feminism might have hoped that lesbianism would liberate women, just as this theorist she sees Janeway being liberated through it. Now moving on to Alien. It is significant that Ripley and the android Call, played by Winona Ryder in Alien Resurrection, have a similar relationship as that of as that of Janeway and Seven. Again, fans of the franchise have also slashed Ripley and Call, <laughs> which means that they've also written some queer fan fiction on them. Not nearly as much as there is on Janeway and Seven, but it does exist. And some theorists have also noticed and discussed their queer relationship. Now, a theorist called Patricia Dericio, for her, the queer aspects of Ripley's persona start to be explored in Alien 3, where her appearance is radically more androgynous than in the preceding films. And then these queer aspects are more fully fleshed out in Alien Resurrection. Now, um, if you don't know about Ripley in Alien 3, she's completely bald. 
I think I've mentioned this earlier in the previous episode, Ripley is completely bald in Alien 3, so um, that starts to kind of preempt her queer queerness in Alien Resurrection. So like Captain Janeway, in Alien Resurrection, Ripley's only female companion is a cyborg who further delineates Ripley's queer persona. Derecio is of the opinion that their erotic attraction is implied more than once throughout the film, and I totally agree with that. If you watch the movie, uh, you can clearly pick it up. And their emotional bond formed on the shared quest to protect and preserve the principles of humanity displays a unique queer post-human persona that embodies genuine humanity and will ultimately save the human race. Now, in Alien Resurrection, Ripley and Cole are actually the only ones that aren't completely crazy or that actually want to save humankind, that have the, the desire to see the best in humanity and to save it. I found it quite interesting that Cole, who is an android, she's not even human, but she's actually the most human of everyone on that ship, uh, which I thought was quite interesting. So again, this is only one reading of the resurrected Ellen Ripley, and it's debatable whether queering her is that subversive or not. For example, the earlier versions of Ripley in Alien and Aliens display as much genuine humanity as of the later queerer version of Ripley. And Ripley saves the world by ridding it of the xenomorphs in every film, not only in Alien Resurrection, whether she's partnered with a woman or not. Anyway, what is significant about this reading of Ripley is that these heroines do have queer subtexts and interpretations by fans and by theorists. So it's significant the fact that these interpretations exist. In my view, these subtexts exist because radical feminism saw the means to female emancipation as lesbianism and the dismantlement of, patriarch of the patriarchal nuclear family and these heroines clearly reflect these notions. So the fact that the possible homosexuality of these heroines is implied, even though it manifests in other forms of, po of popular culture and not actually in the movies that they appear in or the series, um, it is still very significant because this is what radical feminism saw as the means to female liberation. So yes, that is it on radical feminism and that is my analysis of Captain Janeway and Ellen Ripley. I really hope you enjoyed it and um, if you want to catch up on the other episodes, please uh, go watch the introduction and also the episode on early liberal feminism. And then for the next episode, I will look at the final part of second wave feminism, which is cultural feminism, uh, which is quite an interesting discussion. So thank you so much for listening. And this is the Sci-Fi Feminist signing off and then live long and prosper until next week. Bye bye.